Would I ever reconsider letting someone back into my life after they had tried to disrupt my marriage? I never imagined I would. Yet here I am, having done just that. Let me provide some context. My mother-in-law, Madison, was never fond of me. It wasn't anything personal. She was overly protective of her son, Raymond. After her husband left her when Raymond was only three years old, she became overly attached to him, which was quite unhealthy. Raymond realized this, but Madison was still his mother, and he tried his best to keep her from getting upset. Before I came along, Madison had successfully chased away every woman Raymond dated. She resorted to extreme measures to keep them away. She even tried numerous tactics to drive me away, but I was determined not to let her scare me off. I loved Raymond deeply, and Raymond always stood up for me. When we got engaged, Madison visited me and pleaded with me to call off the wedding. She claimed she couldn't lose her only son and had no one else but him. I couldn't understand her perspective. I told her, Raymond loves me and wants to be with me, but he loves you too and will always care for you. Why are you trying to ruin his happiness? He will always cherish you, but I won't let you dominate his life. He is your son, but he doesn't belong only to you. She threatened to ruin me if I didn't cancel the wedding and leave Raymond, but I stood my ground. In retaliation, Madison went as far as canceling my entire wedding by impersonating me and even tried to have me fired from my job. That was when Raymond saw the full extent of her actions and chose to cut off contact with her. We had a small, intimate wedding instead and enjoyed six years of peace without Madison interfering in our lives. During this time, we welcomed our wonderful son, Arthur, and although we were happy, I could see that Raymond felt a void from his mother's absence. His resolve was beginning to waver. I sensed Raymond would relent eventually, and sure enough, when Madison reached out on a new number, begging for forgiveness, he couldn't hold back his emotions. Please, Denise, let's give my mom another chance, he pleaded. She's all alone, and I want Arthur to have a relationship with his grandma. I understood his feelings. After all, Arthur's other grandmother, my mother, had passed away, and I too wanted him to experience having a grandma. However, the trust between Madison and me had been shattered, and I was hesitant to let her back into our lives. Raymond, she seems genuinely remorseful, I admitted, though my doubts lingered. Let's meet her without Arthur around first and see how it goes. We can take it slow and see if she has truly changed. So, we met with Madison, who offered what appeared to be sincere apologies. After much deliberation, we cautiously resumed contact, starting with supervised visits with Arthur. Madison was never allowed to take him out alone. Raymond and I wanted to be present at all times. She never complained and even maintained a civil demeanor around me, but deep down, my instincts were on high alert. I could tell she still harbored resentment towards me, despite her efforts to hide it. However, seeing Raymond happy to have his mother back, and watching Arthur develop a bond with Madison, I tried to put my fears aside. Everything went smoothly for a while. Madison adhered to our rules, and everyone seemed content with the arrangement. That was until Madison expressed a desire to spend a day alone with Arthur, claiming she needed this to strengthen their bond and that she had earned it after three years of following our guidelines. Raymond, eager to support his mother, agreed and dropped Arthur off at her house. When I went to pick him up later, my heart sank. Madison and Arthur were not there. Trying not to panic, I reminded myself they might have just stepped out to the park or a nearby restaurant. Holding on to that hope, I repeatedly called Madison, but she didn't answer. As my worry escalated, I struggled to remain composed, fearing the worst yet hoping for a simple explanation. My anxiety skyrocketed as I faced an unsettling scenario that I was wholly unprepared for. When Madison finally answered the phone, I blurted out, 
Madison, where on earth are you? I came to get Arthur, but neither of you is here and your house is locked. Her reply was oddly cheerful. It's a nice surprise, isn't it, Denise? Confused and increasingly alarmed, I pressed on. I don't understand, Madison. I need to know where you are and where my son is. Can you please tell me? Wouldn't you like to know? She taunted. What if I'm not in the mood to tell you? I was growing incredibly frustrated with Madison's evasive and playful attitude. I pride myself on being direct and forthright, always getting straight to the point. I don't appreciate evasiveness or unnecessary drama, so Madison's games were particularly aggravating. Her tone was too cheerful, too mischievous. It set off alarm bells in my head. Madison, I'm not in the mood for games right now, I responded with a hint of irritation. It's late, Arthur needs his dinner, and he has school tomorrow. Please, just tell me where you both are. No can do, Denise, she continued to dodge. I don't feel like sharing our location right now. But don't worry, we're having a lot of fun. This evasion was infuriating. This is serious, Madison. I need my son back immediately. If you're not going to tell me where you are, you need to bring him home now. I'm not joking around. And neither am I, Denise. Do you want your son back? Well, guess what? My dear daughter-in-law, you won't be getting him back ever again, she declared chillingly. That was the moment when I felt a wave of dread wash over me. Something was wrong. My instincts had been right. Madison's words were not only harsh, but had a threatening undertone that made my blood run cold. Millions of terrifying thoughts raced through my mind. I was scared Madison might do something drastic. I wished I had trusted my gut feelings earlier. As fear took hold, I began to tremble slightly, but I forced myself to remain composed, despite the menace in Madison's voice and the dire implications of her statement. Knowing that panicking wouldn't help, I took a practical step by starting to record the call, guided by the urgent whispers of my instincts. Madison, what are you talking about? This isn't funny. Bring my son back. I'm serious, I insisted firmly. I'm not joking, Denise. I've already told you. You're not getting your son back. Oh, how I wish I could see your face right now, Madison taunted. Please, Madison, don't do this. You're scaring me, and this isn't okay. I just need Arthur back. Tell me where you are, and I'll come get him, I pleaded. To my dismay, Madison burst into laughter at my pleas. It was a chilling sound, and her laughter only heightened my panic. Over the phone, her demeanor seemed increasingly unhinged. Fear gripped me, and I briefly considered driving around town in search of them, but part of me still hoped this was just a cruel joke or some kind of spiteful game. Madison's next words confirmed my worst fears. Oh, are you scared, my dear daughter-in-law? Does it make you sad not being able to see your son because of me? How does it feel to have someone take away your son? Why are you saying these things, Madison? What do you mean? I asked, my voice shaking with terror. This is how I felt when you took my son from me. It doesn't feel good to be the victim, does it, Denise? Madison's voice was filled with malice. Madison, you're acting insane. You don't know what you're doing. Please drop this madness. You told me to stop seeing your son, to leave, to cancel our wedding. But I didn't, and you made him cut ties with you. Do you really think I'd let that go? She ranted. It was clear then that Madison was acting purely out of spite. Her hatred for me had driven her to lose any semblance of rationality. Listening to her speak was one of the most nerve-wracking experiences I had ever endured. The more she spoke, the more I began to tremble, overwhelmed by a deep, paralyzing fear. As I paced back and forth on Madison's driveway, my mind raced with uncertainty. I continued my conversation with her, my voice firm despite the panic setting in. Madison, what you're doing and saying is completely absurd. Raymond's choosing to go with no contact was his decision, not just mine. He loves me, and I love him. If you had accepted our relationship, you could have still been a part of our lives. Oh, stop your nonsense, Denise. My son doesn't need you. We were perfectly happy before you came along and disrupted everything. 
Madison retorted sharply. Madison, you're being delusional. You can't expect Raymond to remain single forever. It's natural for things to change. We are happy and you need to accept that, I replied, trying to reason with her. I don't care if you're happy. I'm not and that's what matters. I've asked you repeatedly to leave us alone, but instead you took my son away from me. So I took action. I took your son just like you took mine. Hearing her words, I was dumbstruck by how deranged my mother-in-law sounded. She had harbored resentment for over a decade, waiting for an opportunity to enact her revenge. The possibility of her harming my son brought tears to my eyes. Trembling, I switched the phone to loudspeaker and quickly messaged my husband, detailing the situation. Meanwhile, I tried to engage Madison further, hoping she might inadvertently reveal their location. Madison, please, this has to stop. You're upset with me. I get it, but leave my son out of this, I pleaded. Oh, please, I'll do whatever I want. You took my son, so taking yours is only fair, she responded coldly. Think about Raymond. You love your son, right? What you're doing now will only push him further away. He'll resent you for this, I countered, trying to appeal to her maternal instincts. Raymond will come around. He always does. Soon it'll be just him, me, and my grandson, and we'll be happy without you, Madison declared confidently. You're wrong, Madison. Raymond will never forgive you for this. He's already left his office and is trying to find you, I informed her, hoping to shake her resolve. It won't do him any good. He won't find me or Arthur. I'll reveal our location when Raymond realizes he made a mistake by marrying you, she replied, her tone mocking. Fed up with her games, I threatened. Enough, Madison. Tell me where you are or I swear I will call the police. Madison's laughter chilled me to the bone. It was clear she had meticulously planned this and wasn't afraid of getting caught. Good luck with calling the cops, Denise. It won't do you any good. What do you mean? What have you done with Arthur? I demanded, my voice breaking as fear and frustration overwhelmed me. As I stood in Madison's driveway, my heart racing with fear, Madison's chilling words echoed through the phone. Denise, I'm not even in your state anymore, so calling the cops won't help you much. By the time they find me, we'll already be gone. Her words were a blow. What is wrong with you, Madison? You need serious help. You're acting psychotic. That will never happen, Denise. It's only a matter of time before Raymond comes back to me. Arthur loves me too, and I'm sure we can convince him to live happily without you. You took one person from me. I'll take two from you, Madison retorted with a twisted logic that sent shivers down my spine. My thoughts spiraled into panic. Meanwhile, Raymond had rushed to the police station to file a report. As I tried to glean more information from Madison, my worst fears were confirmed when she revealed that she had taken my son out of state. My heart shattered, enveloped by a frigid wave of dread. I prayed desperately that Arthur would remember everything I had taught him about safety. Just as I was on the verge of breaking down, a loud banging noise erupted from the phone. I could hear my son's voice, muffled but distinct, arguing with Madison. What's going on, Arthur? Why have you locked yourself in the bathroom? I know you tried to kidnap me and you want to take me away from my mom. You lied, saying my parents wanted to surprise me. I heard you on the phone saying you won't take me back to them. Arthur's brave words cut through the tension. Don't be such a child, Arthur. We're having fun, right? Your dad will be here soon, and then the three of us can have a good life here. We don't need your mother anymore. Madison tried to coax him out, her voice a mix of manipulation and desperation. Hearing Arthur's resistance gave me a sliver of relief. He was okay and resisting Madison's manipulation. It was evident that he had realized her deceit. The rage within me boiled over, and I longed to confront Madison directly for her betrayal and manipulation. Madison was momentarily distracted, trying to persuade Arthur to leave the bathroom. I seized this opportunity to shout into the phone, my voice filled with both determination and maternal fear. Arthur, Mommy is here. I promise you, your dad and I will get you out of this. Please be brave for me. Madison scoffed, dismissing my pleas with cold disdain. 
There's no use trying to make false promises to your son, Denise. But her words fell on deaf ears as my focus remained solely on reassuring my son, fueled by a mix of hope and desperation. In this tense standoff, Madison taunted confidently, You and I both know he will stay with me from now on. There's no way you'll ever find us. However, Arthur's voice came through, clear and composed. Don't worry, Mom. I'm okay. I called the police on the hotel landline just like you taught me. They'll be here soon. I'm still on the phone with them. Holding the cordless phone, he had managed to lock himself in a safe place. Hearing Arthur's words brought a wave of immense relief. The shaking in my legs began to subside, replaced by a deep sense of pride. My son hadn't forgotten the safety lessons I had taught him. Despite his affection for his grandmother, he recognized the danger she posed and took intelligent action. My boy was both clever and brave. Locking himself away and alerting the authorities was exactly the kind of quick thinking we had talked about. As I continued to reassure and encourage Arthur over the phone, Madison became frantic. What did you do, you little devil? You called the cops on me? She screamed. Arthur, I'm your grandmother. Do you think I didn't teach my son anything? He knows exactly what to do when someone is unsafe. He's not stupid, unlike you, Madison. Your game is up, I countered sharply. I can still take him away, Denise. He's still with me and you don't even know where we are, Madison blustered, still trying to maintain control. Unfazed, Arthur interjected, There's no use trying to call the cops. Well, the 911 operator is saying they're already at the hotel and you can't get me out before they come. I won't come out. Mom, we're in Salt Lake City, Utah. Come and get me. My mind reeled at the revelation that Madison had spirited my son three states away, ensuring it would be difficult for us to reach him quickly. Without Arthur's bravery in disclosing their location, we might have remained in the dark. Madison continued to mutter displeased and resentful comments now directed at both Arthur and me. It was a mistake bringing you here, Arthur. You are a wicked child, just like your mother. Despite her harsh words, I was galvanized by the knowledge that help was close at hand, and my son had done everything within his power to ensure his rescue. The audacity of Madison's actions left me seething, but the focus remained steadfast on reuniting with Arthur and ensuring his safety. After the chilling revelations from Madison, I should have immediately gone after my son, but that alone wouldn't have resolved the situation. Madison, defiant and delusional, still believed she could manipulate her way out of anything. Your son wouldn't support your insane actions, Madison. He's at the police station reporting you right now, I told her firmly. No, he wouldn't do that to me. Raymond wouldn't do that to his mother, Madison responded disbelief in her voice. Why don't you ask him then? I'm already at the police station, I replied, knowing full well that Raymond was taking active steps against her. At that moment, Raymond, who had been at the police station just a few blocks from Madison's house, arrived. He looked both angry and worried. Throughout this ordeal, I had been texting him updates, including how Arthur had bravely protected himself. Our immediate goal was to keep Madison distracted until the police could intervene directly at her location. I handed the phone to Raymond as soon as he approached. His anger palpable, he confronted his mother. Mom, what have you done? How dare you kidnap my son and think I would support this? How could you do such a thing? Why are you so angry with me, Raymond? I just wanted my son back. I wanted you back. So I did this. I didn't hurt Arthur. I just wanted to teach your wicked wife a lesson. Madison tried to justify her actions. Don't you dare insult my wife and try to justify your actions, Mom. You are the wicked one here and no one else. After what you did today, I regret ever letting you back into our lives. Raymond retorted sharply. How could you say that to me, Raymond? I'm your mother. I should come first in your life. Your wife has poisoned you against me, Madison pleaded. That's it, Mom. I don't want to hear another word from you. The fact that you won't even take responsibility for your actions says everything I need to know. 
I have already filed a police report and will be pressing charges against you. You're going to jail, Raymond declared, his voice firm and resolute. You want me to go to jail? Madison's voice cracked a mix of shock and defiance. Absolutely, Mom. You're going to pay for what you tried to do. You're never getting forgiven. We will be filing a restraining order and don't even think about coming back into our lives again. You are dead to me, Raymond stated, his anger reaching its peak. Raymond's fury was a clear sign of his absolute resolution. The trust and bond that might have been salvaged had been irreparably broken by Madison's actions. He was prepared to ensure justice for his family. Undeterred by any lingering familial ties to his mother, Raymond was resolute, his determination as clear as day. He was ready to see his mother face legal consequences for her actions, regardless of the pain it caused him. I couldn't help but feel a surge of pride for my husband as he stood up to his mother, ensuring she faced serious and deserved consequences for her betrayal. Madison, on the other hand, was overcome with despair. As the police finally stormed into her hotel room, her demeanor shifted dramatically from defiance to desperation. She cried and pleaded, begging us to intervene on her behalf, claiming she had made a mistake and would never repeat it. However, her pleas fell on deaf ears. The time for mercy had passed. Raymond and I shared a tearful embrace, our emotions overflowing as we listened to the police arrest Madison and ensure our son's safety. It felt like the end of a long, nightmarish ordeal. Following Madison's arrest, the police took Arthur to the station to ensure his safety until we could get there. We immediately booked a flight to Salt Lake City, Utah to reunite with our precious son. When Arthur was finally back in our arms, tears flowed freely from all of us. We reassured him never to let him out of our sight again and praised him for his bravery and quick thinking during the ordeal. Once the police confirmed they no longer needed our presence in Salt Lake City, Utah, we returned home. Madison, having spent most of her money on her impulsive actions, was unable to post bail. We had informed the entire family about her deeds, and shocked by her actions, they too chose to sever ties, leaving her without anyone to turn to for help. In court, Madison appeared remorseful, perhaps finally understanding the full extent of the damage she had caused. However, it was too late for regrets. The judge, unswayed by her remorse, sentenced her to six years in prison after a psychological evaluation, revealed no severe mental health issues, confirming that her actions were those of malice, not madness. Raymond and I felt a profound relief when we heard the sentence, we secured restraining orders to protect our family in the future, determined to maintain them as long as necessary. To help him cope with the trauma, Arthur began therapy, and thankfully, he remained the joyful child he had always been. Our family was finally free from the toxic influence that had loomed over us. Back in the safety and comfort of our home, we could now look forward to rebuilding our lives and cherishing each moment together without the shadow of Madison's manipulation.